Thank you all for coming here uh, uh, today on this beautiful sunny day. Uh, we're going to get into some of the um, secrets and wonderment of um, Michelle Stewart's work. Have, by the way, I just I have just a quick question. Are you all like Michelle Stewart experts, or are some of you, some of you learn, encountering her work sort of initially? A mix, right? Anyway, it's been for me, I'll, I'll just say it's been um, an enormous pleasure and inspiration for, for me um, working with Michelle and curating this exhibition. Um, I think her work is fantastic. I hope you like this as well. And um, so we'll talk together. Would you like to any, have any introductory comments? None. <laughs> <laughs> But the mic works. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, here's the story a little bit. And one of the things that fascinates me, when I, when I got really into this, into this project and working with Michelle, of course, she's a renowned artist, and I didn't want to make mistakes. So I um, did all my research and you know, read a lot of stuff. And you constantly hear this kind of refrain that Michelle Stewart is like a pioneer of early land art and earthworks and one of the few female practitioners. She worked out in the land and she brought nature into her work. Uh, at that, you'll see examples over here. But then she changed later with this um, photographic work. But, that, but what I was seeing was some profound connection that nature continues to flow into her work in every uh, conceivable way. So there's a total connection uh, between this early work from the 70s and the work that you see right here and right now. So I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about nature in your uh, sort of circa 2008 till now works. Um, hmm. I think that one of the most important aspects of everybody loves nature, but I grew up in California and I grew up in a time where nature was really five seconds away. I mean, even though I grew up in LA, um, if you had a car in Los Angeles, and most people did, otherwise they couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> Uh, you were immediately within 10 minutes in fields of poppies and pines and mountains and sea and desert. And um, it was a natural thing to, to play a part in one's soul, maybe. Uh, it's unlike growing up in a tenement or in a city. It's really unlike that. So, you know, um, I suppose any happy child would have embraced the nature, and, and I did. And that doesn't mean that I would necessarily use it in my artwork afterwards. Um, I really think of myself as being much more philosophical uh, oriented or philosophically oriented than nature oriented, but nature is a good device. Um, I really think of it as playing a part in questions that I think we all ask ourselves once in a while, and I certainly ask myself whenever I'm working, and that is why are we here? And, you know, what can I say about why we're here? And um, actually, two of the pieces in this show come from poets. And <clears throat> one of them is T.S. Eliot, and the other one is Rilke. And both of those poets really speak to those questions, I think, profoundly. I mean, one of the pieces is the one mermaids over there. And, and that um, really comes from Prufrock, from T.S. Eliot's Prufrock, where he talks about the mermaids. Why are the mermaids singing? They don't sing for me, but uh, they sing for me. <laughs> Poor T.S. Eliot. <laughs> but I think 
they do. And the other piece that reflects uh, that kind of philosophical bent, I think, is Das Carousel, which is over there, and that's Rilke's uh, poem, which is a wonderful poem about innocence, really. And, and I think what I did was a kind of takeoff on that, but um, it's the kind of takeoff that sees both sides of innocence. And I think that's why, that's why my curator likes that piece so much. Well, talk, it's kind of ambivalent. I want to talk about that in a minute. But here, uh, here's just something I, I want to add, because I, you, of course it's, a, it's all right. I mean, you're the artist. But I, I still think that nature has, is a, has a profound power in Michelle's work that's really unusual these days um, in the art world. And I think that that's something that connects uh, Michelle's work with, with a broad sweep of a kind of visionary tradition in America, leading back to uh, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 19th century and lots of other stuff, a, a spiritualized or, or, or an open, expansive approach to nature. Emerson, who once declared, he theorized about ecstatic encounters in nature that could be channeled into art, but he rarely wrote about them, except for his famous, in his famous 1836 essay, Nature, which is the passage, he was walking across the Boston Common, uh, 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 it, you know, big deal, not the Himalayas, but the Boston Common. <laughs> and, and it's a famous passage that begins crossing a bare common in snow puddles at twilight under a clouded sky, with no expectation of good fortune, I'm glad to the brink of fear. And then he continues, I become a transparent eyeball. <laughs> like, what a heck, as my son used to say when he was like three years old, what a heck That's is a, a transparent <laughs> eyeball. But, it's, but it's, I love this so much, the world flowing into one's consciousness, consciousness, consciousness flowing into the world, and the artworks as a result, and I think for all your philosophy, for all your brilliant mind, that's also going on here. As one goes through this show, you, you go into outer space. You go into the sky above Alice Springs, Australia. You see little ferns and penguins and mushrooms and flourishing trees and all, all sorts of other things, so th this, whole, this whole installation of works becomes so, uh, so expansive, reaching out toward a big world, and also way back into time and way forward into time. Care to comment? Yeah, I, I could comment because I also think that, that um, I think that's very nice, thank you. But I also You're think welcome. that some of the pieces are about that. They're, I mean, one of them is Seekers, yeah. which is about us who seek. I mean, we all do in our own ways and are using our own attributes, whatever they may be, or talents. Um, we're all seeking to find our place, and some seekers are archaeologists, and some seekers are anthropologists. And some are artists and writers and whatever. But I think, I think that those seekers get left out of the dialogue frequently. I think so too. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of it. And? <laughs> OK, so um, one of the joys of curating this show was I knew this work was going to be in it, my still life. But it was not done, because Michelle's been working on this intensely over the last year. So we had many studio visits, and I saw this assembling and this thoughtful force gathering, but still couldn't you know, picture exactly what it would, it would be like. And now it's here. And now I really, really love it, and hope you do too. And Michelle, will, you will talk a little bit. Only this. if you force uh, me. Uh, please do. <laughs> but um, like, for example, by the way, here, here might be also, uh, I, I think that Michelle's making a, a, 
an especially generous kind of art that rewards patient and multiple viewing. I had this experience. I would highly recommend to spend a lot of time opening yourself to this work or any work here and then do it, uh, say, do the same thing again like in a week. I'll almost guarantee you're going to be discovering new things, making new connections. But um, so as you explain just a little bit of what you did here, I want to point out this photo, this work. There is an older woman, a pretty young girl, and an adult a woman. Child. Oh, a child. Oh, yeah. So okay. uh, if you would just talk about my still life and also that particular. Well, image. since you, point, you pointed that one out, I'll, I'll speak about that one first. That was the least likely I would have thought that you would have picked. But uh, that particular piece with the jars in the front is three photographs, two people that I never met, but one was my grandmother and one was my great-grandmother. And the little girl with the goat is moi. <laughs> so, <laughs> and my first tr foreign trip to Baja, California. <laughs> So that's where I saw the goat and somebody photographed me there. But the piece, the whole piece, my still life, is, um, well, I wanted, to do, I wanted to do a special piece for the show. And actually, it didn't take a year. It was less. It was, okay. a, it was a very, um, actually, I worked on it every single day, all day long, sometimes into the evening. And it was a great pleasure. I think, rather than any angst. What I decided to do was, I had written years ago a memoir, which was never published, a memoir with, and which someday maybe will be published. But I decided I wanted to do uh, an image memoir and just use a kind of theatrical one and just use things that were inside my studio. And uh, so I, I set up, a, I guess what you would call a little, a little spot, which was like a little theater set up. And um, what I did was I just changed backgrounds and foregrounds and middle grounds as I wanted. Uh, you know, as I thought were interesting enough to photograph. But they should all tell a kind of story. Um, and a different one each time. So it was in degrees of level and went from sculpture to two-dimensional. And the two-dimensional sometimes were drawings or sometimes were photographs or, or maps or whatever I wanted to use. And the three-dimensional were little like setups as if they were in a proscenium and they were, and they were the, the actors. So I just kept doing that and photographing them. And then I decided I needed bigger paper <laughs> because they were, they were actually much larger in scope than I usually was used to. So, so I got larger paper and, um, and it, was, it, was, um, it was a great experiment for me. I mean, it may go on in some way and it may stop right there in some way. I don't, I don't know. I haven't done another one since I finished the piece, which is a bad sign. <laughs> but, but, um, but I hope the piece speaks to people. I mean, I, I really, it, it has, everything in it is something that profoundly interests me. Um, you know, um, from archaeology to, to what else? To, to nature, actually and above all dogs <laughs> but um you know i could go through you know the whole piece and probably talk about each piece so i will hand it back to you don't hand it back to me <laughs> i mean that that's also very 
wonderful and interesting for me that there's stories, but then stories within stories, and then, I mean, in such a work, and I mentioned the word generous or generosity before. This, I think, is a real characteristic or key to Michelle's work that, that she's not defining things for her viewer. Everyone can bring their own, make their own connections, build their own, their own stories out of hints and sig suggestions. Emily Dickinson once really wisely wrote, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. And I, I love mm -hmm. this idea of slant truth. And I think there's a lot of slant truth operating here. And I think that that also connects with you all. Wouldn't you agree with me that there's something very cinematic about, can, but we, Michelle and I have talked about this and I think it's fascinating. Unlike most, unlike cinema or moving pictures, that one passively sits and they move in front of you. Her works do the opposite. One, one, ha one moves through them oneself, back and forth, a across, making, uh, once again, making connections. Can you well, talk about this? Well, it's non-linear, yeah. I, I, that, that definitely, I, definitely, I, I hope. It's, non-linear, but it's non-temporal as well. And I think those are very strong aspects of it because uh, the pieces go from um, ideas that I have about a certain place, like the South Pacific. The South Pacific looms in a lot of the works because my father was Australian and my mother and father met in Sydney, and a lot of the conversation that went on when I was growing up, or when I was certainly when I was little, was about the South Pacific. And you know, it just I kind it kind of got it became part of me. And I think as an adult, then you start fashioning your fantasies about what it was like then. And um, heretofore, I, didn't, I wasn't doing the kind of work that allowed me to use those things in the work because the work was much more abstract. And um, even though I took photographs, it was about place. So I think what I decided to do about 10 years ago or more, maybe, 12 years ago, I, I decided to use the photography, which I had always done as a documentary um, addition to what I was doing otherwise. I decided to use it as the vehicle for what these ideas I had were. So, and, and it's, it's allowed me to exercise a part of my being and psyche in a different way than, than, than the use of just, and I say this, just earth <laughs> or pencil or graphite or whatever I was using before. It's, a, it's kind of allowed me to be more, um, uh, m maybe a, a little more imaginative in a in a intellectual way, um, uh, and maybe not. I mean, uh, that's that's for you to <laughs> think about. But um, for me, it's been a great ride. I mean, I I love working on on these. Yeah. So back to you. Um, but also, and I hope that. I'd be curious if you, if you wonderful audience that you are, agree with me. But I, I don't think that this is like a photography exhibition, but like at all. Even though there are a lot of photographic images, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what Michelle does. But I think it's it's more like sculpting with images or sculpting with images and sites and places. Uh, and I think that, and I think because M Michelle is doing that, 
that, al that allows you to make such f fleet connections between works, but also to approach how you put work together with such a sense of uh, liberty and, 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 uh, and freedom in, in, and to make like a work that seems very protean and ever-changing. Well, it's interesting that you talk about sculpture because that piece right there, right there, and I don't remember the name of it actually. Um, I have a lot of trouble remembering the names of works I make. But anyway, that piece right there is actually full of sculpture that I made that then I photographed. And, and I made the sculptures years ago. Uh, so it's very sculptural. I mean, it's yes. really about sculpture. But I think the, the way you put the images together is also Well, that's sculptural. a metaphor for, for the seeking of mm -hmm. things and the, you know, um, and, the, and what we do with earth. And yeah, what all of us do with earth and have done with earth, earth since the very beginning of time, of our time human time. Yeah, so, good, good oh. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, um, here is, here is like a very fascinating for me an interesting curatorial experience. I was in Michelle's studio and we were trying, trying to figure out what's the show going to be and what are, you know, what are the works and, and you know, we're both creative forces and how to, we're trying to figure out how things are. And as I was looking through things, I just saw, I call your attention to it, Michelle's already mentioned it, her carousel piece. And it floored me. It stopped me in my tracks. I, I was like, um, it was like instantly in love. And I was like, what is this, you know? What is this carousel piece that seems so haunting and so lovely and so mysteriously meaningful and so just so evocative and she admit I hope you don't mind originally Michelle's like what you want that in the work that in the show you've got to be kidding it's not going to fit uh, but I think it totally does uh, and, uh, and, and, and now fit by size yes but fit by theme is what I was yeah okay I, but I still think it does. But anyway, I, I, it's also interesting, like very interesting to me to, 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 to meet these works, uh, Rucart based in Paris, or, or the carousel work that just go in, in these different ways. So I would, could you talk a little bit more Rukart. about either of those works? Well, Rucart is... Wait, can I have one more question? Have you all seen the carousel piece? Does anyone else love it like I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Rukart is... Um, I just noticed those two pieces are really very similar. Uh, well, <laughs> Rukart is right behind you, and um, Rukart is the street I lived on for three and a half years when I lived in Paris. And uh, so that piece is kind of a, it's a memory piece. It's a memory of a Paris that, uh, when I lived in Paris, which was in the 50s, was a totally different Paris than it is today, or even was 20 years after that. Um, it was a very, um, it was a Paris that wanted still to be in the 30s and 40s, but had gone through the war and unfortunately was really poverty stricken and there, you couldn't buy paper and, but that was the least of the problems. I mean, the people were uh, demoralized really. And um, so it was hard to live there as, as a person who was coming from the United States, which you know, at the time was the big provider, you know, with, with in terms of, you know, living here. And um, Paris was, was very, I mean, clochards who were homeless were actually freezing and dying in the streets. I mean, it was, it was a, a disaster. And um, 
it was a disaster politically too. But I mean, it was it was. Um, but th the beautiful thing about being there was that there was this frisson of the old Paris, and you know the you still had the the circuses that came to each little you know colony and. Uh, you had, you had all the, the, particularly music, which I tried to bring into that piece. It's hard to do, but there's a carousel in that piece. I am well aware <laughs> that there maybe is. Maybe that's why you, maybe you just are fixated on carousels. <laughs> no. But I love carousels too. I, I think that it's a pity that most of them are almost gone, at least the ones that were hand painted and, you know really reflected something of the fantasy of childhood. Um, so, so if you look at that piece carefully, there, there are, you know, people like Mistine Gay and there, there are, it's trying to recapture, uh, you know, Tom Perdu is what it's trying to do. It's trying to recapture maybe what what I remembered from Paris. Yeah, and I don't always work that way, but sometimes sometimes it's really something I have to get out. And you know, if it starts working, I never start anything knowing exactly what I'm going to do. I mean, most of the time I. I start playing with just a couple of images and then see where they take me. And um, sometimes they take me in good places and sometimes they, they, and we don't have any of those pieces up, but sometimes they take me to really, um, you know, extremely political places. But I, you know, it's not politics with a flag or anything. It's kind of reflections on the, on the, the horror with that we can be when left to our own devices uh, in 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 our civilization. Um, there's one piece that I did for Seabald, which is one of my favorite pieces, but I think it was unavailable when we were doing the show, uh, which you know has concentration camp images in it, but not with people, just train tracks and. You know, and um, so it's whatever is somehow, you know, what did someone say about it's an itch that you have to scratch? You know, something that you feel strongly about that's happened during your lifetime that, that you, you want to say something about or, um, um, or reflect upon maybe is a better way of putting it. I, I just have a couple more questions, and then if, it would be great if you wanted to ask anything of uh, Michelle or of me. Uh, there's a couple of things that also strike me as like really, really significant about this work, uh, and so engaging or of interest to me is one the prominence of travel of transportation, of searching and seeking and questing, and that courses through, through every work. This is probably like the, the most much traveling show I've ever been involved with by far and away, even including venturing into like outer space or New Zealand or the South Sea Islands or Peru or uh, 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 so th th that that's something crucial the sense of like movement travel quest and the other thing that I think is unbelievable I mean there's a lot of crucial things including the flat out formal uh, brilliance of how Michelle constructs her works but also um, how time operates here because th these works for me have like an extremely expansive orientation in, in, in time, going back centuries, sometimes eons, uh, and speculating about the rem remote future 
in a in a way, but it but you like it's um you it's almost impossible, or why would one even try to pin a work down um, to a specific time? These works are mobile in time, so I know that's a big thing. But can you talk about um, travel in time? Wow, <laughs> I don't think I'm really capable of doing that. I well, think you've been actually traveling my works are, 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 the, are the vehicle for that rather yeah. than my words. Uh, I'm, of course, very interested in both of those things. Travel, not so much anymore since it's become a pain in the ass. But, <laughs> but I used to love to travel when it wasn't. Um, I guess traveling is, is like, you know, opening up new, it's like reading. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much like reading, in fact. It, it's opening up new worlds to you that, that, that excite you. And, um, and time, of course, is, what can I say about time? Well, you'll have a single work that will have like the 19th century and uh, 21st century, and that's what well, I mean. You know, being I never, it took me years to be able to tell what time it was. My mother said I must have been the dumbest child. <laughs> and I, I was not. I was a very smart child, but I just couldn't, I couldn't fathom time. And I still find that time is, Time is so fascinating because you don't know where you are in it, really. I mean, you know, I'm I'm at the almost at the end of my time, and I feel like I'm at the beginning of my time. That's a good point. You know, so I don't know what to say about time. <laughs> yeah. The codexes? Uh, well, there, we put, well, she put two codexes that, in fact, Holly wanted in the show, <laughs> I mean, uh, which was fine because the two codexes are from, I think, 1980 and 81, or both 81, perhaps. Um, and they, they show the viewer the way I was using photographs in 1981. I was using it before that in other ways, too. But it's a perfect example of a kind of walk through a place. With the camera. <laughs> so I was taking photographs of, uh, I did a whole series. I usually work in series. And um, that was a series, and it included a few places that I was working, and I think, I don't know which ones we have in here. Are they, do you remember the names? No. All right, well, I think they're Kirigua. I think they're from Guatemala. Uh, New Jersey. <laughs> well, that's exotic. <laughs> well, one of them is probably from New Jersey then. <laughs> yeah, the catalog. He's got the catalog. Oh, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. So uh, they're walking around a site and photographing it. And then also, as I was doing at the time, rubbing the earth into the surface of the paper, and which reflected the earth from the place, and then adding the, what was happening to the place in terms of the civilization or, or or in, in, in one case, I think the early civilization. Some of them that I did were just the way it was when I was walking around, and some of them included um, relics from the past that were in the place. And what about the quarry? How did you get to the quarry, and how did you figure that out? Which quarry? The one from New Jersey. Sayreville. Oh, this, is Sayreville in the show? Yes. Oh. Oh, Sayreville, well, Sayreville, now I've, I've, been, I've been chastised about that because 
I thought that Charles Simmons told me that Smithson took him there and he took me there. But Charles Simmons later told me that he took Smithson there <laughs> and he took me there. So um, it was, it, it's no longer there, unfortunately. But Charles and Lucy and I went. And it was this very large territory in near Sayreville, or in Sayreville, New Jersey, which had been a quarry and a brick factory and many other morphs that it had. Um, it was amazing. It was the only thing I've seen in, in the Northeast that had earth that was the color of the Grand Canyon or Arizona or New Mexico or Georgia that kind of really red iron oxide infused earth. And that's why they, and it was clay-like, which is why there, there was an abandoned brick factory uh, on the, on the uh, periphery of the place. But the place was just an amazing place. It was a, a, amazing in the sense of how could you possibly have this place in New Jersey? <laughs> You know, it was, it was like, oh my God, New Jersey? You know, because it seemed like endless plains of different colors of earth. I made a really large uh, strata piece that was four, four strata pieces together, taking four different colors of the earth from that site. Um, and, and they were, you know, about 12 feet high and five, five feet wide. And, and I still have that piece. And it's, it really can tell you exactly what the gradations of, of that site had in terms of the, um, the, the millions of years that had made this happen, really, because that's, what made it happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You get an insight into time. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? Maybe we yeah, can. Now would be a great time. Now it's your chance. Michelle Stewart is right here. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like you're selling cookies. It would be a great if you have any <laughs> questions. Oh, don't, do we have some microphone that you're supposed to? I'll just, uh, I'll just. Um, no, I think this one, right? Uh, Okay. Hi. Hi, how are you? Super. Uh, I'm just going to, after that last question that you had asked uh, earlier about the two pieces over there, um, it, I'm just interested in the idea that at that time we were working in a community. We're working what? Really in a community. And he said, I mean, Smithson was so excited about that site and Simmons. And I didn't know Smithson. No, I, I, I met Nancy at his funeral, actually. Uh, but I knew Charles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And still know Charles. You, uh, when you say community, you mean, did I know other artists? Yeah, I knew a lot of artists, yeah. Not all of them, but... <laughs> Well, it is odd, isn't it? But, but obviously, it's because of Charles Simmons that we all worked there. I'm not sure if Smithson did work there. I'm not sure, but he did go there. Pardon? Was there a consciousness that land, what we now call land earthworks or land art, was there a consciousness that everybody was sort of many different artists working? Yeah, I think there. I think there was a consciousness of that. Yeah. And the difference yeah. between. I mean, it's just interesting. But everybody in a very different way. I mean, really different. It's it, which is, which is kind of an interesting subject. Very. Yeah. That no one really was doing the same thing, or even close to the same thing, actually. Um, I mean, everybody was walking around. So Richard. Who was it that walked? Hamish Fulton? I mean, there was some 
Richard Long and Hamish Fulton. And we're walking around a Hamish, lot. Hamish, Hamish, Hamish Fulton is more like this strict walker. Yes, he's, he's, yes, I love his he's work. He's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, he's good. So any, any other questions or responses? Sure. Oh, this is my still life. Okay, your still life, you, you compress all this space within each photograph. So it's so you're using this depth of field either putting it next to each other or within one photograph. And so I'm just interested about that and, and how you decide the boundaries, how you kind of paraphrase your, all your images when it's enough. I don't know if that's a question, but what happened with this piece is that it was totally a studio piece, which I don't think I'd ever done before. I've photographed things in the studio for pieces, like you know, sculptural things that I wanted to use in a piece. But I've never done this kind of work before, which is kind of still life, you know, and. Um, it was a little scary at first because, you know, we all know great photographers that do still life. And I'm not a photographer. I'm an artist that uses the camera. And that's how I think of myself. But so I, <laughs> I had to play around, you know, to figure out how I wanted this, you know, almost in terms of the way you might think of uh, uh, a painting. I think so. You know? Um, rather than photographically, more in a kind of setup, like you might think of paintings. They operate a little bit like a Cornell box. Yes, that's right. A good point. Yeah. Except it also gets, I agree, but it gets also quite complicated because the th three dimensional vignette or uh, sculpture was made. Uh, in her in Michelle's studio, photograph makes it like two dimensions or flattens it, flattens it to depth. But then the actual images oftentimes are rocketing out far afield. Like you see, there's this like harbor scene with a seagull in the front at the top and looming above it the moon, but like the magnified moon with the craters. And so, all, you know, then all of a sudden, one's <laughs> rocketed out this way. So, so like, Space or a spatial dimension then comes back into it. They, like they're well, some of the photographs were photographs that I had taken before. Mm -hmm. You know, well, a lot yeah. of them. I mean, one of them was a photograph I took in California, in Catalina Island, where I used to go when I was growing up. We well, we went for weekends sometimes. It's an island off the coast of California, and. Um, It's a kind of romantic one. It has a great big moon. Nice. You know. I mean, this crazy. piece is kind of a romantic piece in a way, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, um, to build on that, so each of the vignettes, are they temporary for the photograph? They were totally temporary. Okay, they were just like, you know, <laughs> you know um, I just, you know, put a push but pin are, in. But They're all stuff I own, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I did not buy one thing for this piece. <laughs> if you if you saw my studio and the mass the the mess that it is. No, these are all things in my house. <laughs>
Can I actually, that, what, what you said just, I think, brings up something really important uh, for, for me with, the, with this work. Like, I mean, there are, some, there are a lot of like, artists and uh, like younger artists that are dealing with a welter of images called from the internet. I mean, you know this kind of work. Or with dealing with found objects, a lot of them. But what's really distinguishes this, I think is, in a way, Michelle's care for, the, for, the, for these objects and these images. Her like profound psychological and emotional, no doubt, engagement with these objects, their evocation, their resonance. And I think that's what's also deeply flowing into this work. Like every image matters and, and, and all the things that are in it do as well. Does that make sense? I think it's it so does make much sense. care. Uh, it does make, nobody else could have made it, is what you're saying. It's even like and that's love, absolutely love, true. Love in, love in interest <laughs> and uh, care. And, well, thank you. No, I, I think it is, it, it's, it's unique to me. There's no question about it. Um, but it can relate, like, like she said, it can relate to um, other people who can't part with things they love. Exactly, sure. Yeah. Uh, working in groups really lends itself to rearrangement and tinkering um, quite a bit. And most of these works deal with your own personal experience and memory. So my question is, do you feel as though as you re-remember these times in your life that the arrangement of the works can change? Or do you feel as though they have a static uh, position the works are arranged really on formal, formally. I mean, I, I, I play with, I've always done this, even when I was painting and using grids. Um, I would put them all on the floor and move them around. And these I put on the wall and move them around. Because you still have your formal issues. You have to, you know, you move into a piece, you move out of a piece, but you don't, you don't let somebody move out completely, you bring them back in. And you know, some, some of the larger ones have rather subtle, because you don't notice it, but triangular or, or they're, they're entries and exits, and entries and exits. And then you have a focal point, usually, but you don't allow that to be a focal point that people will all look at. You have, you have things moving around that focal point. It's got Renaissance formal issues in it, if it's large enough. You have to have them, otherwise it's chaos. And, and chaos is all right, but that's not really what I'm looking for. Um, you know, chaos is interesting, too. I'm, doing, I'm working on a piece right now, and every time I look at it and I say, Oh my God, it's chaos. And, and, I, and I think, do I really want chaos? I mean, it's, it's, but I'm figuring it out. I mean, it's, it's really about undersea and, you know, and cosmos. And, and it's hard to get those two things to work together. But it's like, and I keep looking at it, and I, it's in the beginning. That's the beginning. The beginning was like that. You know, with things crawling along the bottom of the ocean and, and up toward land, and things were joyously bounding around the sky. <laughs> so, so, you know, maybe chaos is good too. Yep. Not much. <laughs> no. <laughs> Funny you should mention color. <laughs> there's a very consistent, you know, sort of sepia palette that, I mean, in, in terms of the, the works around here, it's kind of monochrome, but with slight variations. It kind of almost reminds me, I mean, thinking of minimalism and, you know, like Carl Andre's, you know, like metal, you know, squares and things. But then this, the newer work where this, the still life piece is much more saturated color. Well, well, that was done on purpose, actually. That was part of my thoughts about doing this, my still life, 
was that I might introduce a little more color into the work. But you know, I went right back to <laughs> the piece I'm working on now, which, which is virtually black and white. I like the subtlety of some other grays and browns. I have done a couple of pieces with a little more color, but I'm not a colorist. I don't think I ever have been. I don't gravitate toward it in a very strong way. You know, maybe it was like when I, went, when I was growing up, I went to movies and they were all black or white, <laughs> which is kind of part of your psyche when you're, when you're growing up. But um, it's not that I don't like it. Um, maybe that's a whole, you know, maybe I'll take that up in 20 years. I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I, I was just going to say, I mean, it seems like you, the, in terms of the arrangement that you were saying about your, you know, the composition of the grids, there seems to be definitely, a, and you, even when you were saying about wanting to capture music, like, it does, there has to be, there seems to be a very conscious compositional element in the way you're arranging the, the subtle colors within this, you know, range. It seems like you are thinking about color in a, in a subtle way. Oh, oh, I am. I am. In most pieces, I am, definitely. And uh, a, an old friend of mine who doesn't live in New York anymore, Lucy Lepard, who probably you all have heard of it. Sure. Not, you should. <laughs> uh, came to the show last week, uh, and she said... She was here? Yeah. That's great. And she said, you know, the ones I really like are the ones... She, well, she loved the show, which I'm, makes me happy because Yay. I like her a lot, and I like her work. Uh, but she liked the color, the ones where there was subtle changes in the color. Yeah. So... Hold this. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, 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 do, I do use color, but in a very subtle way, I think. Yeah. Do you use color? Yes. Yes? <laughs> Well, maybe you could teach me how to use color. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes. I'm, I'm interested to, um, because I guess I probably use it to use on my own, but to hear from you, how do you transition from the large sculptural works to creating um, the, the gridded uh, uh, pieces that, that are more consistent? I don't want to call them photographs either. <laughs> Images. How about images? Yeah. Um, was that sort of a? I mean, as you said, you you had always with photographs in your work, you got to that. And so was it just kind of a transition from that to? Well, I wasn't only doing that. I, I I know I said that, but I wasn't only doing that. I mean, all the time. I mean, I have thousands of photographs that were not of my work. And it's like having a lot of, of a big palette because I have somebody there working all the time taking those analog photographs, the slides that I took for, you know, 50 years, really, and he's digitalizing them. So I can use them in the work. So a lot of the photographs that you see in, in the pieces are digital photographs taken from my analog photographs. So they're coming from your personal archive. Right, exactly, yeah. That was a good, good question, actually, because I, I never even think of mentioning that. It seems so kind of, you know, organic to me that I don't think of it as a thing to talk about, but yeah, it's <laughs> there is a huge difference, I have to say. I mean, I, I miss the analog photographs. I couldn't do this with the analog photograph, I don't think. It just wouldn't. Did you ever cut them up in collage? Or I've tried. The analog photographs are just so beautiful vis-a-vis -vis the digital. I mean, there's just such a huge difference that it's you want to cry when you see the difference. Um, 
But those days are gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's that question over here. You mean the composition of this? Yeah, the composition of each one. How it, did you assemble these things? Because they weren't assembled like that. You took no, no, I, 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 the, the, the pieces that I assembled it, yes, of course. So how would you do that in the morning? Would you have to uh, a lot of trial and error, yeah. you know. I had a, um, well, I could, let's see. I don't know. I can't remember which ones came first. But the ones that came first were more, you know, putting a, an objet against one of my photographs, you know. And then you start realizing that you can, you can actually get depth by using one photograph and then, then another level by using another photograph or another thing. And you could get these dimensionalities in a, in a kind of, almost like a theatrical, like, like a set designer would, would, would do. Um, so, so first I started leaning them against the wall, and that didn't really work out very well. So then I started um, push pinning different ones on a, on a, on something I could stick the pins in and putting things in front of them and then moving them away and putting other things in front. It was a lot of play, you know, and, and I might photograph, a lot of them, there were five or six or seven photographs and I rejected them all but one, you know. Um, so I have, to, I have to say I enjoyed doing it a lot. I didn't have to go anywhere. I could just, I mean, it, was, it was kind of like a child playing, I have to say. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd be just ready to go there with another, another uh, piece. But one thing you said which, which was uh, difficult, and that was putting, putting the whole thing together because I don't have, the, I don't have a wall this long. I have a couple of great walls in the studio, but they weren't this long. I mean, this is about 30 feet, I think. And if, if I do have one that long, it's encumbered with something leaning against it that I couldn't move. So I did it in first in sections of, you know, six, and then added sections, and then took other sections down, and then photographed them, and looked at how they looked photographed. You know, so I had like one, one half of it on one wall and one half on another wall. I'm telling you which wall in fact. <laughs> and then, you know, played with them, worked, worked them the way, I mean, they could be placed in other positions as well, I think, but this is how I ended up. You have to stop somewhere, right? <laughs> Thank you. Too bad. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you both. Uh, we're going to do book signing here, but also Michelle Brody's there. But I also wanted to introduce Valerie. Can you just stand up here? And Martine, both of their shows, one is in gallery uh, two, one. Gallery one, and then also on the other side. So we're really happy that you could also join us here today. So thank you both. You thank you so job. much. Thank you.